everyone, you're welcome to this, today to today's class. By the grace of God, we'll be considering religious reform under King Josiah, the reformation that took place under King Josiah. And as a word of introduction, in Exodus 20, verse 3, God says, We shall not have any other gods before me. Take note of this instruction, it's going to reflect in the course of our lesson. Adoration of pure worship of God removes the fear of God from people. It's true. The course of time when you adulterate, we mix up the worship of God with other practices that are not in conformity with the worship of God. People tend to lose the reality and the awesomeness that the worship of God is supposed to bring. And definitely the fear of God will be reduced to, to just religion. And then this was the situation in both northern and southern kingdoms of Israel. Israel at this point in time was divided into the northern and the southern kingdoms because Rehoboam did not listen to the words of the elders and then part of Israel, about ten tribes, had gone with Jeroboam and then two remained with um, Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. So, at this particular period, when Josiah became king, Israel was already divided into two kingdoms. And then that was the situation where worship was adulterated completely, the worship of God in both northern and the southern kingdom. Now let's look at the factors that necessitated the worship, sorry, the reform during the time of Josiah. The factors that helped him, those things that came up that just took place, you know, and gave rise to this reform that we are going to study today. The first factor there is religious evils, mostly perpetrated by King Manasseh, Josiah's grandfather. And then we discover that there were so many religious evils that took place in the days of uh, Josiah. Josiah came and found those things in place already. Some of them were perpetrated by his grandfather, Manasseh. Manasseh was one of the kings of Israel. Manasseh became king, died, and his son Ammon became king, died, then Josiah took over from Ammon. Now, I don't really trust practices in Jerusalem, following God with their priests and priestesses, prostitution was prevalent in the house of God, not just in the towns and the cities, but right in the temple, in the house of God, in Bethel, in Jerusalem, those things were prevalent, were happening. And definitely, the uh, must, have, must, must, must attract the anger of God. Shrines in all the cities, idols were worshipped both in Judah and Northern Kingdom. Shrines, high places were built, were raised, not for Jehovah, for God Almighty, but for idols, bars, ashtarots. High places we are raised. And of course, child sacrifice, which was practiced at a place in Judah called Tophet, according to Assyrian religious practice. Child sacrifice was one of the practices of the Assyrians and the Israelites now imbibed and followed this practice you know, and they began to use it in the course of their worship. And that became a serious mixed up adulteration of the worship of Yahweh in their time. Now, the use of mediums and wizards. You know, some people were killed, of course. If they have stopped consulting with God and they are consulting only with mediums and wizards, what do you expect? Whatever they told them to do was what they were going to do. So children were killed innocently because they were assumed to be the causes of the problems of the people at that particular point in time. Then note this, the practices above contradicted the commands made of God. All that we have said so far have contradicted what God told them, especially I told you to take note of Exodus 20 verse 3. We shall have no other gods before me. Now let's look at the next factor. The discovery of the law book, the book of Deuteronomy, 2 Kings 22, 1 to 11. Also necessitated the reform carried out by King Josiah. 
and let's see how it happened. It was discovered by him a priest joining the Revelation in the 18th year of Jesus' rule as king of Judah, where whose father was Ammon and mother Jedidah. Very important to note this factor because when the book was discovered by Hilkiah, he now presented it to Shaphan, the secretary to the king, who read it out to the hearing of the king. Let's see that. It was sent to Josiah through Shaphan, the king's secretary. So what happened? From the book, he realized that the people had deviated from the ideals of the worship of God. They had deviated completely. And he discovered that judgment was imminent. Judgment was imminent. This was one major factor that necessitated the reform by King Josiah. Let's look at the next factor. The prophecy of Prophet Eskuda, when the book was discovered and Josiah discovered that actually judgment was so eminent that God was going to bring upon Judah. He, got, he was felt so sorry, he tore his clothes, put on sack clothes and lamented and repented of the sins of the fathers, the sins of his generation and even his personal sins. He repented. So he sent elders, people, to a prophetess known as Buddha to inquire of the Lord, to inquire of God what he had to say concerning Judah at a time like that. And let's see what happened. Of course, from her prophecy, God's judgment was very imminent. She declared it so clearly that judgment of God was coming upon Judah for their iniquities. But look at what happened. Look at what happened. Because Josiah was penitent and humbled himself before the Lord in verse 11 to verse 12. See what happened. God said Josiah was not going to see the calamity that would befall Israel in his days, but in the latter days. Because of repentance. He felt sorry for the sins and the iniquities of his fathers, the iniquities of his people, and his personal iniquities. And God said to the prophet Eskuda, go and tell the man that sent you. Because he was penitent at the word of the book, this judgment shall not come up in his days. It shall come in the latter days. Very, very significant to note. Let's look at the next factor, the favorable political situation of his time. You know, at the time when Josiah became king, already Israel was a vassal nation to a suzerain Assyria. They were answerable to them, they were paying allegiance to them. No wonder you could see point of even borrowing their religious practices because they were a weak state, a vassal nation to the Assyrians. And therefore, it was an opportunity to reject the Assyrian domination as the reform involved purging Judah of Assyrians' religious practices. Of course. It was an opportunity for, for Josiah to lead the children of Israel to rejection of the domination of the Assyrian because he wanted to purge them of every evil. Now let's look at the information properly now, the preparation and measures that Josiah took in order to bring this reform to reality. The first thing he did was he started with Judah. Remember I told you that already Israel was divided into the southern and the northern kingdom. So he began with Judah. When he began with Judah, let's see what he did. Josiah read out the book of the law in the presence of the people and renewed their covenant with God. He took them to the temple and read out the book to them. And all the people renewed their covenant, renewed their allegiance, and agreed with Josiah and gave him the opportunity Trinity and the open hand to do whatever he thought it right to do to return them to God Almighty. And see what happened. Eradication of idolatrous, idolatrous practices in Jerusalem temple, foreign gods like Asherah, Baal were removed and burnt at Kidron outside Jerusalem because those things were already erected. High places for worship, for sacrifice of even people we are already built. And so he went into the temple, to the high places, to the cities and towns, and raised down those high places. And adulterous, 
Idolatrous priests we are deposed, we are taken out of the city completely. Taken out of the city completely. Child sacrifice, which was practiced at Tophet, a place in the valley of the sons of Hino, where children were offered to mourn the Assyrian God, was abolished. You remember what I told you? Child sacrifice was part of the Assyrian religious practices. And the Assyrians were offering children to their God known as Molech. And Israelites now borrowed it and were offering to idols. Not to God Almighty, of course, to idols. And all those things were stopped by King Josiah. The use of medium and wizards stopped, which means they have stopped consulting with people and other spirits other than God Almighty. They returned back to God and began to consult with God. Now, let's look at the reform in the Northern Kingdom of Israel. Reform in the Northern Kingdom of Israel. We are done with the reform in Judah. That is the Southern Kingdom is called Judah. And here we're going to look at the reform in the Northern Kingdom of Israel. Destruction of the high places. Foreign gods and the altar at Bethel, Bethel of all places. Raised high places. Altars were built there, but Josiah destroyed them. He destroyed them completely because they were not in conformity with the worship of God Almighty. He defied and destroyed all the high places in the cities of Samaria, the default capital of the Northern Kingdom. Remember what I told you? Northern Kingdom had its capital as Samaria, while the Southern Kingdom had its capital as Jerusalem. So, all those places, he defied and destroyed all the places in the cities of Samaria. Entirely because he wanted the people to return back to God Almighty. This time around, the idolatrous priests in Samaria were not deposed, but were killed. They were killed by King Josiah. Let's look at the outcome of the reform. It succeeded in eradicating adulterous practices in Judah at that period. Mark this word, at that period. It succeeded at that period. Very important. Jerusalem became the only legitimate place of worship. You know, when Israel divided into two kingdoms, the northern and the southern kingdoms, those at the southern kingdom with their capital in Jerusalem, we are worshipping in the Jerusalem temple. Jeroboam, who led people to the northern kingdom, he built high places, he built a temple, a place of worship for them in the northern kingdom, just in an attempt to stop them from going to the south to worship. And of course, that became a problem to them because instead of worshipping God Almighty, they were now worshipping idols. And Israel almost became like two different independent kingdoms. A country that was, a nation that was meant to be one. So Josiah in his time succeeded in bringing them together and bringing them to a common place of worship in Jerusalem. Very important. And then look at this. The Passover feast was celebrated at national level in Jerusalem by all the people. It was a privilege again once more to bring back the, the, the festival, the feast, known as the Passover feast. You know, we always do this to commemorate how God was so merciful and gracious to their fathers in Egypt. Let's look at it. The reform was not actually without a weakness. The reform was not without a weakness. But let's see what really happened in the course of time. The success was external and left the people internally bankrupt. Yes. It only succeeded in destroying all the high places, the, the altars built for Baals, for Asherah, and the rest of them. Only succeeded in destroying those places. But the hearts of the people were still far from God. We are still far from God. And of course, it was so evident 
in the course of time. It was evident in, Jeris in Jeremiah's prophetic ministry towards the end of Josiah's reign. It means the people began to go back again to those practices because the problem was still there, was the problem of the heart. As much as those physical things were destroyed, the image and the idols were still there in their heart, and they began to go back to those worship. And then Jeremiah began to make a prophecy concerning that. So, please, I want us to take note of this, and don't forget this lesson. It's very important because we have considered those factors that necessitated the outcome, the lessons we can also learn is what I want us to check right now. Look at the significant lessons that we can actually draw from this before. Leaders should be sensitive to the commandment of God. Leaders, our spiritual leaders especially, should be sensitive to what the man God says. Make sure that the people follow God's instruction. The injunction of God concerning the people should be followed duly. Repentance makes God to withdraw his punishment on sinners. Yes, as we could see what happened when Je Josiah repented, tore his cloth and was sorry, and he called upon the name of the Lord, God forgave him. And because God forgave him, he said he was not going to see the evil that he was bringing upon Israel. So also with us today, God forgives. The Bible says, he who confesses and forsakes shall receive mercy. With God there is mercy. If only we can confess our sins and forsake them, he's ready to forgive. Idol worship should be discouraged to avoid God's anger. One thing that can easily attract God's anger truly is idol worship. Worshiping other things other than God. As a child of God, as a child of God whose faith is in Christ, you are supposed to do away with any other thing that competes with the sovereignty of God. I know in our days might not be structures, images, things we have raised in the churches, in our homes. No, not even in some of the shrines you have. No. It could be things, blessings that God has even given us legitimately that have taken our heart away from God. Those things have become idols. Legitimate blessings could become idols. And God says, His anger is imminent. Anytime He sees anything, any thought, any imagination, any object, whatsoever it is, competing with Him, in our lives because he's a jealous God. Remember this, if God will not spare the children of Israel, he can't spare us now because he's still a jealous God. And Christians should always meditate on the word of God to prevent them from deviating from the idol worship of God. The servant says it all, your word have I hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. It means what has the power and the capacity to keep a man from sin is the word of God. What can keep, show you the way out and in so that you avoid sin is the word of God. The same psalmist says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It means I can't even take a step until your word defines the path for me. So just know that meditating on the word of God daily Keeping to his ordinance does not only help you to obey God, it keeps you away from sin. Because Jesus himself could not avoid the world if he must overcome the devil during his temptation. So please, take note of these lessons. They are very important for us. Let's walk in the reality and in the assurance of what the word of God says. That's why Remember what I said here, I said leaders should be sensitive to the commandment of God. It means they should know when the people are deviating from what God says. They should know when the people are not getting it right and quickly bring them back to the instruction that, they, God, that God gives in his word. Very important. That will avoid 
anger from God. There are assignments I want us to take note and make sure you do. One to three, very simple, but you need us to study, we study those scriptures and make sure you consult other books to write this. And please, when you do it, make sure you submit this assignment. And we will so much waiting for us. I'm eager to mark your assignment. Please submit this assignment through the following contact as much as you can. Thank you and God bless you.